Now, I'd like to have Dr. Kenny actually illustrate a few more of these details about x-ray and MRI, and so I'm going to ask him to point out some of those finer points for us. Thanks, Dr. Simonstead. Now, the role of imaging in the diagnosis of, uh, of hip impingement is multifactorial. We can identify other causes in the patient's hip joint which may be causing their hip pain. And in patients with impingement, we can look very closely at the different shape that their hip joint and socket has. Um, typically, we usually start with x-rays, followed by the MRI. And at the same time as the MRI, as Dr. Simon said, pointed out, we do do that pain injection. Now this is a diagram from the literature, and on the top you can see there's normal hip, and then below that there's the pincer type hip, which is a problem with the socket, and below that the problem with the head. Now let's start on top. This is a diagram as though you're looking at the hip joint from the patient's feet. Here's the front of the socket, and here's the back of the socket. You can see that the head has a nice round configuration. The socket covers the head well, but not excessively. And then you can see that there's a nice tapering or narrowing that you see where the head joins the neck, particularly on the front part. Now in this part of the diagram, when a normal patient puts their hip through a range of motion, there's no abnormal bumping of these structures, there's no collisions inside the joint. Now compare that uh, below here to the problem with the socket that we refer generically to as overcoverage. In this patient, the hip is tilted abnormally so that the anterior part of the hip joint overhangs too far. And when that same patient puts their hip through a range of motion, they can have two different uh, areas cause problems. First off, this part anteriorly impinges on the neck, causing labral tears and cartilage damage in this location. And then posteriorly, you can see that the head is levered out the back, and it can cause tears and cartilage damage here. Now finally, the type of impingement associated with abnormalities of the head or neck is referred to as cam impingement. And on this diagram, you can see there's a large bony bump that they've outlined here in gray that is the so-called cam lesion. And when this patient moves, this, this bony bump is what's banging into the front of the hip joint, causing those tears in the labrum and damage to the adjacent cartilage. Now let's take a look at a couple of radiographs. Typically, x-rays are the first test that's utilized to evaluate virtually any patient with hip pain. We can look for the other causes of their hip pain, whether they're bony, or in patients with impingement, we can look at the shape of the hip joint. In patients with cam impingement, it's the abnormality of the head or neck, as we talked about. And then in patients with the pincer type impingement, it's an abnormality of the socket, where the socket is abnormally tilted, or perhaps it's just too deep. And let's look at a couple of x-ray examples. Here's a patient who has the so-called cam type femoroacetabular impingement. You can see that the head in this patient is very large. And on this lateral view, you can see that the front of the hip joint, there's a very prominent bony bump compared to the backside, which is scooped out normally. Now this structure, this bump, has been chronically impinging on the rim of the acetabulum here, leading to cystic changes in the head. You can see that bone irregularity there corresponding to the cyst. And calcification along the rim of the socket here, either within the labrum, or it can be frank fracturing of the bone in that location. Now below we have a diagram from the literature and you can see they've outlined what you would expect to be a normal hip uh, joint. There's a nice round head and you can see in the dashed line they've outlined this abnormal bone protuberance that causes that cam impingement. Now off this groin lateral view that Dr. Simonstead talked about, we measure a number of different angles and measurements to help give us an idea of just how large this bony bump is and how much bone Dr. Simonstead is going to expect to encounter at the time of surgery. Now, in patients with cam impingement, the other term that people will commonly talk about is the so-called pistol grip deformity. And you can see on the x-ray here on the left, there's a fairly prominent but, but relatively smooth bony bump. And then in comparison to a water pistol and antique pistol, you can see that that shape of the head and neck mimics the shape of a grip of a pistol. Now, let's compare that to the pincer type impingement or the problem with the sockets. We have a number of diagrams here. At the top, we're talking about the abnormal tilt, and at the bottom, we're going to show a too deep of a socket. Now, this is a normal patient, and you can see in the dotted line, they've shown the two walls of the socket. Here's the anterior wall, and here's the posterior wall. Now, with that anterior wall further medial from the posterior wall, when this patient moves, uh, this forms a nice clearance so that that head and neck can rotate in and around the hip joint. 
In this other patient where the acetabulum or socket is tilted abnorm abnormally, when we outline those same walls, you can see the so-called figure of eight or crossover sign, where this anterior wall at the far top of the joint overlaps and extends lateral to this posterior wall, and it's this overhanging rim of bone that bumps into the femoral head and neck causing the patient's symptoms. Now at the bottom, with too deep of a socket, or the so-called protrusio deformity, you can see that this socket is very deep. It covers all the way down into the patient's femoral neck. And when this patient moves their hip, this whole acetabular rim can impinge on that neck area, causing problems. Now as Dr. Simon said had talked about, the MRI is typically the best test for evaluation, evaluating these patients with suspected impingement. Now we typically accomplish that with an injection inside the hip joint. And the reason for that is relatively simple. In a normal hip joint, or a joint without much of a joint effusion, um, there's only a few drops of fluid in the normal hip joint, and the structures are fairly collapsed against one another. Now by introducing a small amount of fluid, we can space those structures out, and that fluid tends to track into the areas of the labrum that may be torn, or the cartilage that might be damaged. And we'll look at a few examples of that right now. Here's a case of cam impingement on an MRI arthrogram. This is a frontal view, and this is a view of the hip as though you're looking up from the patient's feet, just like those diagrams. Now here you can see clearly they have a very pronounced pistol grip deformity. Instead of being a nice, small, black triangle, the labrum's very flattened and irregular, and there's some fluid tracking up underneath that. Now when we look at this other view of the hip, and we look at that front of the hip where the head joins the neck, you can see this very large ridge of bone. And when this patient moves their hip, that ridge of bone is going to impact right here along the hip joint. And you can see that unfortunately this patient is starting to develop some early labral tearing and early cartilage damage in that area. Now while typically we do make the distinction between the cam and the pincer, in other words the head of the socket problems, in reality Many patients with hip impingement actually have a combination of the two, and this is an example of that, the so-called mixed impingement. Here we have a view from the front, and you can see that the patient has a very prominent pistol grip deformity on this part of the head, but in addition to that, the acetabulum is very deep. It covers all the way down to the femoral neck. Now if we look at these two views, taken from the bottom of the patient as though it was looking up, this is the labrum. This should be a very small black triangle. You can see that it's torn, it's detached from the rim of the socket, and this bright material here is that contrast material that's tracking into the tear of the labrum. We can see it's torn in the front, it's torn in the back, and on this other view we can also see that it's torn there in the front. Now for the selective injection, that's the pain test that Dr. Simonstead had referred to. And before uh, Dr. Simonstead or a patient are going to embark on a surgery to try to correct the impingement problem, it's imperative that we confirm that the patient's pain is indeed coming from the inside of the hip joint. We accomplish that fairly easily under x-ray guidance, and you can see we have an image here from an injection. After giving some numbing medicine, we slide a small needle down to a particular part in the hip joint. We inject a few drops of iodine contrast that you can see pooling here normally in the hip. And after we know we're in the right spot, that's when we fill the hip joint up with uh, approximately 10 to 12 milliliters of fluid. Now in that fluid, we typically have the MRI contrast and the local anesthetic. And the patient's uh, results of that pain injection is very dramatic. In patients with impingement, prior to the injection, they'll have very severe pain, particularly when the hip is placed in a very specific position. And then after the injection, within a matter of seconds or minutes, the pain is generally completely resolved. And on this slide, I'd just like, like to remind people what we're hoping to avoid. Here we have two patients. You can see that they have very large bony bumps and bone spurs forming because they've gone on to develop severe degenerative arthritis of their hips um, from unrecognized or undiagnosed impingement. 